twice for this speech, uh, Shelby Steele, James Q. Wilson, I should have started down this list. But we're delighted in the tradition of these outstanding speakers to have with us today James Pearson. But I would want, first of all, before we have our lecture, to uh, give you an opportunity to express appreciation to Rosemary Arcada, who is here with us. Rosemary, would you stand and let us express appreciation? invited to Rosemary's uh, club over in, in Thousand Oaks and um, yeah, if you haven't been you, you probably will be so we're delighted that she's been so encouraging to our students outside class one-on-one -on -one as well and we're delighted to have her sister Beatrice with us also today Beatrice I'm going to ask uh, Bill Simon in a moment to introduce our speaker today because our speaker is the president of the Simon, the William E. Simon Foundation. Uh, and I must say that uh, the Simon family has been a great source of encouragement to the School of Public Policy. Uh, they, um, at the very beginning when we launched this, uh, Bill Simon's father was a member of the uh, board of the Olin Foundation. The Olin Foundation provided funding for us to attract some of the outstanding faculty that we have had in the early years of this school. And then after the Olin Foundation made their last grant, um, the William E. Simon Foundation, on whose board Bill Simon uh, sits, uh, took up the cause and has made it possible for us to have a number of outstanding distinguished visiting professors that we never could have had otherwise. And frankly, they have not only been a great patina to build the reputation of the school in its early years, but it provided an opportunity for our faculty to have access to some of the finest minds and some of the most gifted professors that we could possibly have wanted to attract in these early years of the School of Public Policy. And um, I'd like to take this opportunity, Bill, since I've been, Bill and I have been exchanging, uh, he's been all over the United States the last three or four days, and I've been chasing him on his phone, and I got a, my cell phone rang late last night, and I was out with Gail to dinner. Um, and so we finally connected this morning, and I got him here uh, to introduce our speaker. But, uh, Bill, I just want to say, uh, since you are here, how much all of us here appreciate what you and your family have been to this School of Public Policy, and we really do appreciate it. Will you join me? For the <laughs> some, some of what I said was actually true. <laughs> well, thank you, Jim. It's nice. It's very nice to be here, and uh, you have in front of you a description of some of the things that uh, my friend Jim Pearson has done during his extraordinarily distinguished career. I have to say that in addition to that, for me, Jim Pearson is a beacon for me personally. Uh, he has been associated with the Simon family, first my dad, now myself and my brother and my five sisters for almost 30 years now. So I think I can speak with some knowledge of Jim, not just on the basis of what you see in your program, which is terrific, but also based on Jim personally. And I believe Jim is one of the most competent but understated people I've ever met. Uh, he's humble, he's thoughtful, he's thorough. We all have people in our lives that we turn to when we have difficult decisions, whether they be personal decisions, professional decisions. For me, that person is Jim Pearson. Uh, Jim uh, is just somebody that you always know you're going to get a very candid, very compassionate, and very thoughtful perspective. And I would say that Jim has done many things that he would never tell you about unless you either asked him or you might ask somebody else because he is such a humble individual. I 
have the privilege of doing some teaching now, uh, sometimes here at Pepperdine, sometimes it's in neighboring institutions. And it's really because of Jim. Uh, it's because uh, he said to me, this was a great activity for me to be able to think through things, to be able to be prepared. So he now is teaching here this semester. And he said, this is a lot of work. <laughs> and I said, Jim, this is what you got me in today. <laughs> and you can see in your program that he taught uh, on the faculties of a number of institutions, uh, one of which is Indiana University, which is where my wife went to school. So immediately my wife is a great fan of Jim's because she's a Hoosier. And uh, we've had a lot of thoughts over the years about Jim. And I, my wife, is, as some of you know, like Rosemary, who is a great uh, you know, friend to our family. My wife is a woman of very few words, but listened very carefully. And uh, she said, I love Jim Pearson. And, and that's, a, that's not something that my wife says lightly. So as I mentioned, you have here his amazing accomplishments uh, in the public area, but I will tell you that I would drive anywhere to hear Jim Pearson speak on any subject. So without further ado, my good friend Jim Pearson. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, I don't think I can live up to that introduction. Uh, but thank you anyway. I've, uh, my, almost my entire adult life has uh, uh, been bonded with the Simon family, and I'm so grateful uh, to Bill's dad, Bill, Pete, the entire family. It's a, a great American family, and I've been privileged to know them uh, so well and to, uh, to work with them over all these years, so thank you, Bill. Uh, Rosemary Licata, thank you very much for your generosity to the Pepperdine School of Public Policy. This is a great institution, and everyone here is grateful for your uh, collaboration with their efforts. Uh, Jim Wilburn, thank you. Uh, I've long admired Jim's work at the School of Public Policy. This is one of my favorite institutions. Uh, I haven't visited here very often, and I'm so grateful to be able to be here today. <clears throat> well, let me begin. Uh, enough about me. Uh, let's uh, get to the subject, uh, which is uh, the fourth revolution. That is my subject today. The United States has been shaped by three fundamental revolutions. The American Revolution and the constitutional period that followed it. The Civil War era uh, and the Great Depression, New Deal, World War II era. All of these periods and events uh, led to a restructuring of American institutions and the infusion of new ideas and ideals into those institutions. <clears throat> the question I pose today is this. Are we on the verge of a fourth revolution that will repeat in certain elements, but obviously differently, uh, the history of these three great transformations that we've been through in American public life? <clears throat> I believe we are on the verge of uh, a fourth revolution. Uh, and let me tell you today why I think that. I don't know what this will look like. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, there is a path out there. We don't know if, there, if there's a cliff at the end of it. Uh, we don't know uh, if there are some false trails out there. There may be an open field uh, that will lead to a new era of progress and growth for the American community. We will have to uh, shape that future for ourselves. Notwithstanding its uh, reputation for stability and continuity, uh, American public life has been interrupted by severe periods of instability, upheaval, and indeed of revolution. And I've mentioned three of them. This seems to be a unique feature of American life, these upheavals. Why? Well, one reason many have given is that we have a constitutional system that disperses power, 
that makes it difficult to come to a resolution uh, of, a, of a problem until it reaches a point of crisis. Underlying this constitutional order, we have a very dynamic economy in society, which is constantly changing and throwing up new problems for our public, uh, for our political system to address. But the system addresses it very slowly, and often not until there's a point of crisis. And that has happened in the past. Now, there are a few superficial similarities in these three revolutions of the past. They've all lasted one to two decades, from the time they began to the time they arrived at an institutional settlement that allowed the country to go forward under a new arrangement. <clears throat> uh, and they've occurred roughly 60 or 70 years apart. It was about 70 years from the ratification of the Constitution to the outbreak of the Civil War, roughly 70 years from the end of the Civil War to the outbreak of the Great Depression and the New Deal. Of course, we're now at a period of 65 or 70 years since those upheavals came to an end. And that is one of the reasons that I think we might be on the verge of some new such event. It may require an entire lifetime for people to live under a, an, a, under a system uh, for, before one of these events takes place. One reason for that is that once people have lived under a system for a lifetime, they think it's a permanent thing. They can't see outside that system. As a consequence, they can't make the adjustments to the changes that are in front of them. These are superficial similarities. At a somewhat deeper level, all of these upheavals have seen a, uh, uh, a replacement of an old elite by a new one, a circulation of elites. As an old order was discredited and a new one was built, Jefferson, in 1800, his party discredited Hamilton and the Federalists. Uh, when Lincoln came to power, that discredited the old order of slavery. When FDR came to power in the 1930s, that discredited the old order of business bankers and laissez-faire capitalism. And a new set of elites uh, came into power. And not only into power politically, they tend to take power in all sorts of subsidiary institutions, colleges and universities and their faculties, for example, uh, newspaper editorial boards, cultural institutions. The, the, the transformation of political elites tends to flow down over a period of time into subsidiary organizations. And so this transformation that we're talking about politically has a wide uh, effect on other institutions. And more fundamentally, each of these transformations was carried out by one particular political party. Uh, in the 1790s and early 1800s, it was Jefferson's party that overthrew the Federalists, guided America through a period of expansion and expanding democracy. Uh, that system came apart in the Civil War. From the late 1860s to the Great Depression, it was Lincoln's Republican Party uh, that shaped that settlement and guided the country through a period of capitalist and industrial development. And from the 1930s forward, it was FDR's Democratic Party that organized the welfare state, guided the United States through World War II, uh, and forward into the contemporary period. I call these regime parties. These are the parties that engineer the important settlements. And then on the basis of those settlements, they carry forward and dominate the political system for a generation or two into the future. It is said that America has a two-party system. I think more accurately, we've had a one-and-a-half party system. We've had throughout our history a dominant regime party. Jefferson's and Jackson's party from 1800 to 1860, Lincoln's Republican Party from 1860 to 1930, FDR's Democratic Party from the 1930s on into uh, the end of the 20th century. Uh, I 
say one and a half party because the opposing party must make an adaptation to this dominant regime party. It must say, in the end, we too, but not quite as much. Uh, and in that sense, they provide an opposition, but they rarely fundamentally challenge the settlement that was achieved. One thing that one uh, must watch out for as a sign of an impending crisis is the evolution of what I would call two regime parties. Two regime parties in competition with one another are two parties that cannot live with one another. One must win and the other must lose. Uh, uh, and the very, their very existence denotes a crisis. This happened in the 1850s uh, between the parties that wanted to curtail slavery and those that wanted to extend it. Are there signs this is happening today? Perhaps, but let me get to that. <clears throat> Now, the question that I'm raising then is the great settlement that we achieved in the 1930s at a point of exhaustion. Is this system that Roosevelt put together, carried forward by Truman and Kennedy and Johnson and now Obama, is that system on the verge of uh, disappearing, of crashing, of exploding in a crisis? Uh, that's a good question. Now, there are many people who say that, and I've been one of them really, that really Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, uh, uh, he exposed the New Deal and put in place something somewhat different. Uh, that the Reagan Revolution, the conservative revolution of the 1980s, ended the New Deal and the Democrats as the regime party. I don't fully buy that idea. There's much to be said for it, but here's why I don't fully buy it. One, Ronald Reagan accomplished a great deal in ending the Cold War and getting our economy back on a path of growth. He was a great leader. Uh, he and Roosevelt, the two great leaders of the 20th century. But in the end, uh, it's very hard to think of any major government program that Ronald Reagan and the Republicans were able to end in the 1980s. I don't think there are any, to be honest. And in this whole period, only one major program was even uh, reformed, and that would be the welfare program that uh, Clinton and Gingrich uh, reformed in the 19, 1990s. In addition, there was no <coughs> recirculation of elites as a result of Ronald Reagan's presidency and the conservative revolution. College faculties, newspaper editorial boards, cultural institutions, they're probably more liberal today than they were uh, in the 1960s and 70s before Reagan came to power. There's been no circulate, circulation of elites, as I call it. What has happened is something somewhat unprecedented in American history, is that we've developed uh, on the conservative side of the spectrum a kind of a counter-establishment a counter-establishment of think tanks, of book publishers, of schools, uh, of newspapers, television networks, which has challenged the established order. And this, uh, this is new in American life, I think. I think a historian of the 19th century might suggest that something similar to this happened in the period leading up to the Civil War, where the two parties had their own cultural institutions. Uh, but this certainly is something that's developed in the last 30 years, and many of the people here, myself included, participated in the building of that counter-establishment. But for these reasons, uh, I think that the Democrats remain what I call the regime party, and that Obama today very uh, clearly continues to represent that. Uh, now, in the past, these regime parties meant something very important. The Jeffersonian party meant expansion. It meant frontier democracy. It meant slavery. Lincoln's Republican Party meant union, nationalism, capitalism, industrial development. 
FDR's Democratic Party meant national regulation of business, expanding the welfare state, integration of new groups into the political process through civil rights and related kinds of movements. What is the inner core of the Democratic Party? Well, I think one could say that they built their coalition around the concept of public spending. The, Demo the core of the Democratic Party today represents uh, public employee unions uh, and various beneficiaries of government programs. In a sense, we've evolved two conflicting parties, one very much associated with the public sector, one very much associated with the private sector. One very strong in certain parts of the country, the so-called blue states, another in uh, other parts of the country, uh, the south, the southwest, and the mountain states. So in that sense, we've evolved these conflicting uh, narratives of American life. If there is an intellectual godfather to this idea of a party organized around public spending, obviously it was John Maynard Keynes. The, theorists of uh, modern managed capitalism. Keynes was a great man, a great thinker, who tried to come to terms with the crisis of his day. And the crisis of his day was this. He felt that World War I had destroyed the foundations of the capitalist order as it developed in the 19th century. Uh, it had destroyed uh, the Bank of England which, uh, and the prosperity of the British, and they had been uh, the institution that uh, provided stability to the international trading system. Uh, it destroyed, it wiped out the wealth of Europe that had been built up, and uh, it destroyed the, the psychology of the capitalist order, which is very forward-looking. After World War I, people in Europe became quite pessimistic. Prior to World War I, it was the very wealthy classes that provided investment capital for the growth of the European economy, and they heavily invested in American railroads and fa uh, factories at the same time. They were wiped out. So Keynes' idea was that the capitalist order had to be put on new intellectual foundations. And that foundation would be the operation of the state as the kind of lender and investor of last resort. Uh, which would provide a function both of smoothing out the operation of the capitalist economy and then using public credit to bring the economy out of its periodic bus. Uh, that was his thought, and that is the theoretical foundation of uh, the concept of a political party built around public spending. Now, of course, this is a dream come true for a politician to be told. What? You mean I can spend money and borrow money and it's good for everybody? and I can do this without limit. Uh, this is somewhat of a lesson that some people took from this. Uh, so Keynes prescribed a new, a new foundation for the operation of modern capitalism. Instead of saving, planning for the future, self-denial, he prescribed debt, consumption, and public spending. And that somewhat is the system that we have built today. And the question is, after 65 or 70 years of this, is this thing coming unwound? Uh, has it reached a point where we can't, this, this prescription uh, can no longer work? <clears throat> now, that is my thought. Now, just to uh, uh, go off on, on a slightly different theme, uh, you might say that uh, we have two different economies in America, or two different approaches to the economy to parallel our two parties. We have what we call, we call the blue economy, as some people have called it, associated with the Democrats, and a red economy associated with the Republicans. That blue economy took shape in the 30s and 40s and matured in the 50s and 60s. What was it based on? It was based on large industrial organizations, large labor unions working in partnership with the federal government. Uh, they, this was a source of our post-war stability and prosperity. The idea was that a high school graduate or a college graduate uh, would work in a career uh, as a 
factory worker or as a manager, largely for a lifetime. Over a period of time, uh, they would generate uh, benefits in the form of health care, longer vacations, they would move to the suburbs. They would build their life around this orderly system of industrial capitalism, provided for by big auto companies, uh, large labor unions, monopolies in the form of telephone companies, uh, large institutions like IBM, and so on. Uh, that was a three-legged stool of, of the federal government, uh, large labor unions, oligopolistic corporations. And that is a system that I believe that Democrats have tried to keep in place. Uh, Obama's stimulus package, of course, bailed out the auto companies, uh, sent money to the state and local governments, reserved the, the benefits especially in some large states like California, Illinois, and New York, that those states have provided. On the other side, we have the red economy, which seems to be skeptical of this, uh, oriented more to free markets, uh, distrustful of a large federal government, distrustful of spending, uh, distrustful of the ability of the federal government to manage the system any longer. I'm not sure if either of these systems can go forward into the future, whether a Keynesian system or a free market Hayekian system, whether these, whether these will be the kinds of systems that we, we follow out into the future. One thing about this so-called blue economy is this. Two of the legs of that stool have fallen off. In the 1970s and 1980s, all the big companies the auto companies, uh, the telephone companies, the airline monopolies, they all began to fall apart. And the private sector unions also began to disintegrate in the 1970s and 80s and uh, ceased to be an important part of, the, of that post-war system. What is left is big government. That is the one, one leg of the stool that continue to, continues to sustain itself in my opinion, that is now on the verge of collapsing as well. And why? Well, the theme is, is the themes are familiar to everybody. Let's go through them. There are about three of them. Uh, uh, there would be debt. There would be uh, uh, unsustainable federal spending. There's economic stagnation. And there's political paralysis. The latter is important, political paralysis, because it means that we will not achieve any preemptive solution to the problems that we face. Okay, we're all aware of the debt. The federal government has a, by the end of 2012, the federal debt, accumulated debt, will be $16 trillion. That's on a real GDP of $15.5 trillion. We'll have a federal debt that's larger than our economy. Uh, about, of this debt, about $11 trillion is held by the public. That means that the government makes interest payments to the public. Now, of course, the public includes the Chinese government, the British government, the Saudi government, and uh, a lot of banks and manifold individuals and mutual funds who buy federal debt. $5 trillion is internally held by the government. Uh, in uh, loans uh, that have made, been made from trust funds, mainly the Social Security trust fund, to cover federal debt. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. We pay about $250 billion, I think it was $275 billion in 2011 in interest payments. That's 6% of the federal budget of $3.8 trillion. This is in a period of very low interest rates. Those rates obviously could go up probably will go up because they can't go any lower since they're close to zero. Uh, the, the federal government does not pay interest on that internal debt. If they did, you could double that $275 billion. Why don't they pay interest? Well, they do pay interest, but it doesn't show up on the books because uh, the government borrows from the Social Security Trust Fund and they pay interest. They pay interest to the trust fund and that goes down as a debit but it also goes down as a credit because it's uh, also a payment to the federal government. So 
but washes out in the federal books. So it's it totally possible that within a few years, if interest rates go up, uh, or if our creditors stop buying our debt, that interest rates might even double, and we might be paying 10 or 20 percent of the federal budget in interest payments. That's entirely possible. What will happen then is that, and I think this is likely to happen, is that we'll, we'll develop a warfare uh, within the public sector among groups that receive government money for shares of those funds, uh, which are being crowded out by interest payments and slow growth. That's one big problem. We've accumulated this huge debt. Uh, now, that doesn't even begin to get into all of the unofficial liabilities of the federal government. Promises made to seniors, uh, guarantees for uh, federal mortgages, loan guarantees of foreign governments. Uh, some people think that that could be as much as 50 or 60 trillion dollars in unofficial liabilities, which probably cannot be paid. All right, that's one problem, the big debt problem. Uh, President Obama is projecting a debt in fiscal year 13, he just released his budget, of close to a trillion dollars. Uh, that's based on some fairly rosy assumptions. Uh, his budget does not call for much of an increase in federal spending. The spending is fairly flat. He's moving a lot of money, however, out of the defense sector into the domestic sector. Well, on top of this, we've got uh, very large federal entitlement programs, which you're all aware of. Uh, currently, the government spends $725 billion a year on Social Security, uh, and another $650 billion on Medicare, a number that's going up rapidly every year. So that's, that's close to $1.5 trillion per year on old age, pension, and health care systems. Throw in another $250 billion for Medicaid, and we're approaching $2 trillion per year on just these three programs, again on a federal budget of $3.8 trillion. And these are expanding much more rapidly than anything else. Now, this is even before the baby boomers have begun to retire. There are, ladies and gentlemen, there are about 75 million baby boomers who are on the verge of retirement. These are people born between the ages of 1940, between the years 1946 and 1964. There are currently 45 million people on Medicare, I think 44 million on Social Security. By 2025, 12 years from now, we might have 80 million people on Medicare and Social Security. It will almost double with health care costs rising. We have a workforce of about, well, we have about 125 million jobs in the U.S. economy. We have a workforce of about 160 million people. So we have about a 60% participation rate, and we've got four or five million people unemployed who would like to work. The job force is growing very slowly. Uh, less than 1% per year. I think it's 7 tenths of 1% per year. So we're adding uh, about a million people to the workforce per year. Therefore, we need 100,000 new jobs just to keep those, uh, per month to keep those people employed. But, as I say, uh, people going on Medicare and Social Security, that population is growing much more quickly. So in 10 or 15 years, and I'm speaking to the students now, uh, we could have 80 million people retiring, uh, receiving benefits, old age benefits, which they've paid into. And we could have a workforce of 130 million people paying for them. I don't think that, I don't think that is sustainable. I don't think the young people can pay for it, and I don't think they will pay for it. What happened then? Well, that's a very good question. I think this is likewise a recipe for political upheaval, as these promises, implied promises, are broken. I don't think it's fair to say that they've been broken. 
It's that promises were made which were never realistic to begin with. Now, you could always say, well, why hasn't our government made preparations for these events? After all, all these 65-year-old people didn't just uh, appear out of nowhere. They've been around for 65 years. Uh, plenty of time to plan for it. Well, what have we done? Well, in 2001, President Bush signed a new prescription benefit for Medicare, expensive, that was never paid for. No provision was made to pay for it. Now, he's been criticized for this, but in his defense, the Democrats proposed something even more expensive. Uh, and uh, they were likely to get that unless he counted. So both parties were complicit in this. There's one reason I say that the uh, Republicans have not yet been able to supplant the whole New Deal idea that we can build coalitions by public spending, because they were forced into this. Uh, Richard Nixon signed the COLA uh, increases for, that's the cost of living adjustments for Social Security, for the same reason. The Democrats and the Congress were going to pass it anyway. Even if he vetoed it, they'd pass it over as a veto. So he signed it. Well, that's one thing. And then President Obama in 2009 signed another a very large entitlement program to expand health care coverage for people who are, not, who are uncovered. On top of this, I've already mentioned the fact that the federal government has borrowed up to $5 trillion from the Social Security Trust Fund, which between 1983 and 2008 were, was accumulating annual surpluses. And we're paying interest into that, supposedly as a bookkeeping measure. How is that going to be paid back to support Social Security beneficiaries in the future? It has to be taken out of ordinary tax revenues. There is no trust fund. It's just a bunch of IOUs. Uh, and the money has been spent. So not only have we not made preparations for this event, we've done the reverse. We have dug ourselves deeper into a hole for when this, this time arrives. Then there's the problem of economic stagnation, slow growth in the American economy. We know what's going on now, but this is a, something of a long-term problem. Decade by decade, the American economy has been growing slower and slower and slower. During the 1950s and 1960s, uh, gross, real gross domestic product grew at an annual rate, average annual rate in those 20 years, of about 4.3%. That's very robust growth. People look back to that era uh, with some nostalgia because the, eco the economics of that period were so great. Of course, it was helped by the fact that our competitors were flat on their back from World War II, and we were supplied uh, most of the durable goods for the rest of the developed world during that period, until they caught up with us. That's the 60s. In the 1970s, that annual growth rate fell to 3.7%. It fell further in the 1980s, which we regard as a good decade, to 3.5%. That's the average annual growth. In the 1990s, it fell to 3.2%. And then in the decade from 2000 to 2009, it grew at a rate of 1.7%. Now, let's take out 08 and 09, the recession, and just look. What, how did it grow between 2000 and 2008 and take out the recession? Well, that number is at about 2.6% per year. So even if you take the recession out, the growth was slowing decade by decade. Of course, a mature economy grows a little bit more slowly than an emerging economy. I noted that there are some features in the 1950s and 1960s that can't be repeated. But whatever the cause, this long-run stagnation places an enormous burden on a government that's running a very large debt and has uh, entered into implied agreements with senior citizens to pay for their health care and their pensions uh, at a time when it's not unusual for people to live to 90 or 95 years old. <coughs> well, isn't it possible then, you'll say, for Congress and the President preemptively to solve this problem? We had the Bowl simpson uh, approach a few years ago. That was very sensible, in my opinion. Many people thought it was very sensible. 
restructuring the tax system, uh, uh, reforming entitlements. It went nowhere. And of course, the two parties have engaged in this negotiation for the last couple of years, and it leads nowhere. Uh, and nothing is done. So, as they say, we continue to kick the can down the road. In my opinion, there will be no preemptive uh, solution to these problems. One reason is they're too deep. The thought of cutting 20 or 30 or 40 percent uh, out of our federal spending uh, to cover the current deficit and to begin to pay it down, that's completely unthinkable to most politicians and most, uh, most voters. That's not going to happen. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it's unrealistic to look at the political pro look to the political process for a solution to a problem that the political process has caused. So the regime of public spending that we have in America has, at long last, drawn so many groups. Uh, into the public arena in search of public dollars, that it has finally paralyzed the political process and driven governments to the brink of bankruptcy. These groups are, are uh, attached to both major political parties. It's not just the Democrats. Uh, one thing, so we have two presidential candidates on the Republican side, Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum, the former members of Congress. When they left Congress, did they go back home? Gingrich to Georgia, Santorum to Pennsylvania. No, they stayed in Washington and represented groups that were seeking funds from the government. Uh, and they defend this, and they have a right to make a living. But I think that is a reflection of the system that we live under, that Republicans must do the same thing as Democrats do. They, on both sides, uh, they do that, and because all the interest groups that converge on Washington know that they have to build bridges to both parties. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about trade associations that are looking for tax breaks, uh, or trade associations that are looking for protection against foreign competition. Uh, we're looking at public employee unions who want more government spending to pay their salaries. Uh, education unions throughout the country go to Washington for funds to have that money sent back to the states to augment their spending. I saw a few weeks ago that the mayor of Los Angeles was criticized for not going to Washington and getting federal dollars to support his city. Of course, all mayors do that. All governors do that, Republicans and Democrats, because, as Willie Sutton said, that's where the money is. Uh, and it's always better to go to the federal government to get the money than tax your own people. Of course, it's a kind of a shell game because we're all sending the money to Washington and our taxes and coming longer and being sent back to the states. Now, economists call all these groups rent-seeking groups. And what does that mean? Uh, rent-seeking groups are those that are interested in the distribution of wealth, trying to lay a claim on existing wealth, as opposed to groups that are generating wealth. So all these groups are descending on Washington in search of public dollars or public benefit of one kind or another, because there are enormous sums there. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is our federal government has an almost unlimited capacity to borrow, which it is making use of. Uh, now, why don't these rent-seeking coalitions, the education unions, the trade associations, uh, and others, why don't they say, well, our government is broke. So really, let's not go and try to get any money from the government because we can't afford it. No one thinks that way. They think that, well, the little piece that I'm going to get won't make a difference. Besides, if I don't take it, somebody else is going to take it. The problem is everybody thinks that way. So everybody uh, descends on Washington to get, to get more money, even when the system is on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, and that is the logic. So. All the interest, group, the interest groups have very little concern about the overall public interest. It's not that they don't care, it's that they can't influence the public interest. They're trying to get their piece, and they will continue to do so. Now, the late economist, Manker Olson, argued that uh, when rent-seeking groups 
in a system become pervasive and ubiquitous, that tends to slow down the long-term growth of those economies. That's because these, these groups are interested in distribution rather than the creation of wealth. And uh, so Olson argues that this is why the American economy grew so rapidly in the 19th century and the early 20th century. These rent-seeking groups had not formed. The economy was largely free. Investment flowed to areas of opportunity. He also argues this is why after World War II, Japan and Germany also grew so rapidly. Because the war cleaned out all the interest groups that had accumulated in the decades before that. And they were free to pursue market policies that allowed them to grow very rapidly, of course, until after a generation or so of this, those groups began to form. And we know what's happened to Japan. So the, the consequence of a political system built around public spending and the accumulation of rent-seeking groups around the national state is political paralysis and economic stagnation. That is what uh, Van Carlson suggests. So this problem of paralysis is somewhat baked into the cake. It's augmented by the fact that the two political parties have diverged to a point really unknown in our lifetimes. That is to say, I've said that they represent somewhat two different regimes, two different areas of the country, two different approaches to the economy. Now, I say this is new. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, could have been nominated in 1952 by either the Democrats or the Republicans. Both parties wanted him. Uh, that's, the point there is that there is a kind of a consensus between the parties so that they could nominate. There's one guy who could have won the nomination of both parties. Uh, Richard Nixon, when he ran against Kennedy, if you remember those debates, students don't, but you may have seen the films, uh, Nixon said, we both agree upon the general goals, we just have different approaches to get there. The point was, there's not much difference between, between these candidates, they're basically uh, very similar. Uh, so now, in terms of the parties today in Congress, there's almost no ideological overlap between the two parties. In the 1950s and 1960s, you had a lot of ideological overlap. You had progressive Republicans, liberal Republicans, uh, some represented by the state. Uh, and you had many conservative Democrats, mainly from the South. And they formed bipartisan coalitions. There is a conservative coalition of uh, Republicans and Southern Democrats that often blocked uh, liberal legislation from the 40s into the 60s. And there is a liberal coalition of liberal Democrats and progressive Republicans that passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964 and passed Medicare uh, in 1965. Well, that's gone. The most conservative Democrat in the Congress and in the Senate is more liberal. Let's see if I can get this right. It's more uh, liberal than the most liberal Republican. So if you, if you just kind of map the ideological distribution of the two parties from left to right, there'd be no overlap. We have a liberal party and we have a conservative party, and that makes it very difficult uh, for these two parties to negotiate a settlement. In a sense, they have to negotiate with one another like foreign governments negotiate with one another. Or perhaps as the two sides negotiated with one another leading up to the Civil War. And those negotiations are often not very fruitful. Well, what happens? What happens? We've teed up an extremely difficult situation in America. Uh, politically, financially, economically, and in all sorts of ways. Well, I think uh, it, it does not appear that there will be a, uh, that the bond market will revolt anytime soon uh, against U.S. debt. Interest rates are very low. Whenever there's a crisis, more people flood into the debt market and buy American treasuries. However, the problem is that you never know when the crisis is going to happen. Mexico in 1994 hit a wall 
almost overnight, and no one would buy their debt, and they had to be bailed out. New York City, the same thing in 1975. The banks were helping them roll over their debt. One day they said, we're not doing it anymore, and that was the end. Uh, something similar has happened to Greece. Uh, no one thought three or four years ago Greece would hit a wall, two years ago even, but they did. So that can happen very quickly, and these markets can come to a conclusion about a country's solvency overnight. That could happen. We're vulnerable to a recession, slow growth. Uh, gas prices could go up. We could have a revolution in the Middle East. Uh, we could have a terrorist attack. Any number of things could happen that would throw this system into a crisis where we would have to slash our spending, we couldn't borrow money, and we couldn't meet all these obligations we have. Uh, so, in, some, in a certain sense, I think right now we're skating on thin ice, and we're just hoping that the economy will recover enough, that nothing significant will happen out in the world, and we'll be able to lurch through this thing and come out of it without making any fundamental changes. We have to be very lucky for that to happen, in my opinion. It's definitely a possibility. And we're beginning to see, as I say, some of the political implications of this situation. For example, I'm not sure that candidates in the future will be running about expensive, will be uh, basing their candidacies upon expensive new programs they're going to mount. They have to be, they're going to be talking instead about how we're going to cut this deficit, how we're going to restrain spending, and that's a much different environment uh, to run for office in. Uh, Newt Gingrich's idea of a moon landing uh, notwithstanding. So, President Obama uh, came to office a few years ago promising really to be all things to all people. Not really, but that's what some people say. He was determined to be a revolutionary president who brought about change and ushered in a new era of progress. Uh, he announced his candidacy in Springfield, Illinois, with the implication that he was going to be another Abraham Lincoln. He won the endorsement of the Kennedy family, who hoped that he would be another JFK. When he came to office, he called forth resemblances to FDR, uh, the man who brought uh, America through the Depression and through World War II. More recently, he adopted the mantle of Theodore Roosevelt and his concept of a new nationalism. Of late, he sounded like Harry Truman running against a, quote, do-nothing Congress. Uh, all of these images President Obama uh, has encouraged. I expect the president to be re-elected in the fall. We had this discussion beforehand seem to have a modestly improving economy, and we seem to have quite a weak Republican field that uh, Republican voters seem not to be very enthusiastic about. With that mix of things, it's very difficult to defeat an incumbent who has some reasonable level of popularity, and I think uh, I <coughs> recently President Obama has gotten his popularity up to about 48%. And in this circumstance, that might be enough to get them through, unless something happens, especially to the economy, during the rest of the year. That would probably vindicate his assumption that he is a revolutionary leader and a herald of a new age, like Jefferson, Lincoln, and FDR, the authors of the three previous revolutions. But is it possible? that instead of Jefferson, Lincoln, and FDR, President Obama may turn out to be something else. A John Adams, a James Buchanan, or a Herbert Hoover. That is to say, a final representative of an order on the verge of collapse. This is not only possible, but I fear extremely likely, as the blue model that he represents continues to disintegrate before our eyes. Thank you very much.
I, I want to mention to those of you who are students who have to eat before your next class that um, we will have a reception immediately following this, and uh, I think we do, out to the courtyard and turn right. You may even be able to, to munch on that and make lunch if you want to hang around. Let's take, uh, you know, maybe 10 minutes here for questions and answers before some of you have to leave. And um, my, I, I, without giving the first question, I was remembering uh, one of our former presidents here at Pepperdine, Bill Panofsky, uh, used to have a statement to me once in a while. He'd say, Jim, if you're trying to encourage me, I wish you'd quit. Um, but uh, somehow we've managed to um, find opportunities in, in these moments of crisis for new beginnings. Anyway, let's take uh, a couple of questions. For the, we'll have another 10 minutes here for question and answers. And uh, if you'll keep your questions short and not speeches. Uh, and uh, we'll have a, a microphone. I'd like to for, for everybody to hear the questions. So let's begin here. Yes, After this, we'll take a question from the students. I want to give the students an opportunity to. Mr. Pearson, since the states are, ex we refer to the states as experimental laboratories. So, and so I think in order to see what's going to happen in the future, look at Wisconsin and Indiana right now. And what would be your comment about that? Well, I, I think Wisconsin and Indiana are, are indicators of one approach to this crisis. Wisconsin is particularly interesting because it's a progressive state. And we'll have to see if that will hold up in this uh, recall election in the fall. Perhaps it will. Republicans, are true, are, are preemptively trying to address this problem in some circumstances. It's not clear, and this is all necessary to do. It's not yet clear that the public is there. Uh, partly we'll see this in Wisconsin. Indiana has always been a fairly conservative state. Well, in Ohio, the, uh, the go Republican governor accomplished something similar and was, and was o overridden by the voters. That is to say, uh, he made an effort to decertify the public employee unions uh, in an effort uh, to save money and somewhat weaken their political power over the state and to encourage job growth uh, in the state, which is in financial trouble. But the voters uh, didn't accept that. I think what you do have is you do have a bifurcation in the states based upon these two models that I described, a kind of uh, low tax, low regulation, uh, non-union, uh, low public spending a jurisdiction in which Republicans are influential, and pro-union, pro-regulation of business, high tax uh, jurisdictions were Democrats. Uh, these Democratic states typically, not completely, are the ones that have had these budget crises over the last three or four years because their budgets are much higher. And they've responded in some states, Illinois would be an example and Connecticut would be an example, by doing something just the reverse. They have made enormous increases in taxes to pay these bills. We'll see if that works. Uh, both Connecticut and Illinois did that because uh, Democratic governors won these elections. So we are we are seeing, I believe, this uh, dealignment of the of the parties and the states that they control moving in an opposite direction. Somebody has done a study in which they've shown that the Democratic states have much higher per capita debt than Republican states. That's that's true. Surprisingly, Connecticut has the highest per capita debt of any, any state in the country. That seems somewhat surprising. Um, I did not mention the whole pension fund crisis in the states. The, uh, the states that have well-organized public employee unions, of course, have made these promises to pay their pensions in the future and their health care. But notoriously, they've not funded these programs. So they're, they're radically underfunded. Uh, a study that was done a few year, years ago suggests that they're only funded to about a third of the amount of money that's needed. So that when uh, retirees start to collect, this is going to have to be taken out of general revenues. And again, in 
competition with funds for universities, uh, for welfare, health care, and all the other things that uh, many of these states are doing. So, uh, yes, and of course, I think the Tea Party is also a sign that something is happening out there. One thing about the Tea Party is that they are not institutionally powerful. The Tea Party is a kind of a grassroots movement of the people. They, these are people who typically are not integrated into institutions that have leverage over the system. Uh, and this is one reason I'm not sure that they'll be able to sustain their influence. Very good. Professor Pearson, thanks for uh, being with us today. We appreciated your, your talk. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of historical examples and some of the political science literature on it, um, specifically Michael Walzer's book, uh, Exodus and Revolution, um, lo looking at the historical trends of, uh, uh, of revolutions and, um, and oftentimes how generations will come back to make correct decisions after 40, 80 years, however long it might be. But also um, looking at uh, maybe Rome or Greece, as you mentioned, and outside of America, how sometimes uh, generations make wrong decision after wrong decision. Um, do, you see, do you see the possibility, not necessarily of collapse of American society, but of continual wrong decisions made uh, by, by the American populace? Well, that's a, a terrific question. All these questions are great. Of course, many people are talking about American decline, and uh, they make the comparisons to Rome, sometimes to Great Britain, uh, 100 years ago. I'm not necessarily a believer in American decline. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think the American people will put up for very long with a stagnating economy. That they will, at some point, intervene uh, and and set this right. There may be a, a, some failures along the way. Uh, no one anticipated that uh, Ronald Reagan would step forward and, and correct these problems that we had in the 1970s. One, one difficulty here is that we spent a lot of our ammunition that Reagan used. That is, he cut taxes, he deregulated things. We've done that. Uh, I think we're probably going to wind up raising taxes. That's certainly part of a big tax increase in President Obama's budget. Uh, so if I understand him correctly, he's talking about uh, raising taxes on people who make more than $250,000 and tripling those taxes. Uh, that's on the, on the capital gains aspect. He wants to raise that from 15% to 40%. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm a, I, I believe more in what I call upheaval. I'm not sure these are revolutions. I think America is going to go through a phase where it tries to correct these problems. I don't think this necessarily means decline. Uh, it may mean decline for some sectors of the economy and polity. Uh, just like in the South, the Civil War had a kind of a negative effect on the development of the South. Uh, and something similar happened in the, in the 1930s. That's, but I don't necessarily think that America will, will decline. I think that we'll find our way through this after a period of upheaval that may last 10 or 20 years, as these problems bubble up. That would be my, my answer. So short term, I, I, I think that we're going to go through a difficult time, but I think uh, if the past is any guide, that America will, will come out of it. Much changed, however. We may have time for one more question. If uh, any other students or Yes, sir. Uh, when you use the word revolution, am I being heard? You are. Yeah. That, uh, to me, means something dramatic. And maybe upheaval is dramatic, but I don't sense anything what you said that you think is going to be really revolutionary. For example, I would think to solve some of our monetary problems, we're going to hyperinflate. That, to me, would be revolutionary. Any other comments you might make? Well, no, I agree with you. Revolution is probably not the right word. I use the word upheaval. Maybe 
maybe that's too strong too. I've used the word realignment, political adjustment, uh, instability. There are a lot of things that could happen. I don't think we're going to overthrow our government in the revolution. I don't think that's likely to happen. Uh, there are some people who think that there will be a period of violence. I don't necessarily think that's going to happen. We could have uh, a period of rapid inflation. That's possible. As a, as a government strategy, I'm not sure that will work. One reason for that is many of our government programs are indexed for inflation already. So that will just increase our expenses. Social Security is indexed to, in, to inflation, and aspects of Medicare are indexed to inflation. Um, union contracts are indexed to inflation. Uh, and of course, interest rates will go way up, and uh, that, will, that will make the problem worse. So uh, it could happen, but it's not a good strategy. So I take your point. I'm not talking about a revolution. I'm not sure I'm talking about an upheaval. I'm talking about a period of political instability where we, uh, the parties change hands, perhaps. The parties get redefined. We address these problems. Uh, the losers in this situation are probably not going to go quietly. They're going to protest as their contracts and, uh, are, are renegotiated or promises that they thought were made to them are broken. That's not going to be a pleasant circumstance. So uh, I think as, as all this comes to the fore, we will, have, we will see things in America that we've not seen for a long time. But I think we will we'll get through it. And I, I think it will happen uh, in the next uh, 10 to 20 years that we will, we will see these things happen. I think I may be responsible for the title of the speech today. I came up with Fourth Revolution. So No, that's a term I've used. I, I, I thought it was. At least you approved it when I suggested it. Um, you know, the, the, just my closing comment here is, those of you who are students in the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine University, what this really means is you've got lifetime employment. These are challenges that you're going to be prepared to meet. And uh, that's why we're talking about them today. Would you join me expressing appreciation one more time? And we are glad for you to join us, to hang around, and uh, you, uh, in fact, uh, Jim, you may want to head on out first so that uh, you're not stuck down here. Um, maybe, maybe you can help uh, him see where we're going to be having the reception. You're all invited to join us, and um, you can chat a little more with our speaker. And uh, Rosemary, thanks again for your encouragement, and Bill, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.